now we're going to talk a little bit about how do we educate the stewards of tomorrow, and in some cases the stewards of today, um, to be more sustainable. So I'm joined by Miriam DeGrave, the head of academic sustainability at IESEG School of Management. Maybe that's pronounced differently, but... Yes, Egg. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Viviana Alvarez, the former head of sustainability and corporate strategy at Unilever North America and the executive director of CDOTS, and Anastasia Luchenko, executive director of Manasia, to think through what does that look like. So normally we kind of start with the need and, and um, how do we make changes to the system. What I would like to start with is what does the ideal education system look like today? to actually prepare anyone who's in higher education for the roles they might need to play in business moving forward. If you could draw out your ideal world, what does that look like? Mariam, why don't we start with you? Sure, yes, yes, yes. Um, so in order, and maybe just starting with a few words about who we are, who we are at ESI, so we're a um, one of the leading management schools in France. We've got 8,000 students across two campuses in, in Lille and in Paris. We've actually got 11 of them today that are majoring in, uh, in sustainability. And I think one of the, I guess in my ideal picture, there's a strong sustainability journey from day one, from the day when students uh, join the school, up until the moment when they graduate, and even after, during the, throughout their professional lives, that really embeds sustainability competencies across the whole curriculum, not just by having uh, some dedicated sustainability courses or a sustainability master. These are great, but they're not sufficient. You actually need to rethink the whole curriculum, to rethink how you define business success, how you teach uh, finance, how you teach supply chain, uh, marketing, etc., etc. So that no matter what students major in, they have the, both the technical skills that are required on their, in their discipline, but the technical sustainability skills. For instance, someone majoring in finance will need to understand the CSRD. They will need to be able to assess climate risks. Someone majoring in marketing might need to understand greenwashing. Uh, on supply chain, it might be traceability, etc. cetera. It's, it's, so, so they have the technical skills, but also the leadership to drive change, the, the, you know, to, to drive change and convince people within their future companies. Uh, and also the systemic thinking, that's the third thing, really understanding the links between different planetary boundaries, between the environment and society. I mean, this morning we heard um, EV uh, are the solution for sustainable mobility, and of course they're great for climate, but maybe they have some other impacts on planetary boundaries. So ideally, in my ideal world, students also have that systemic understanding of, okay, when you move one cursor, how does it impact the other ones? So. Does that mean, Viviana, that what the purpose of education is needs to change a bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the, the, in an ideal world, the first thing we, we should do is realize that we are in a revolution of systems. And this fourth industrial revolution means a lot of opportunities, but many challenges. And one of those is the readiness of people for this transition. So I do believe we are in a Kodak moment for the academic world. There's there, there are speedboats like ESA and other business schools that are realizing that the gap in terms of what is needed versus our current education systems is very big. So first is what do we need to unlearn, right? Because what took us here is not going to take us there. And one of the big aha moments I had, in, I lived in Unilever three years ago and in the hype also of, oh my God, I need to learn AI. What do I need to learn and what comes next? And in that pursuit and my concern about the crisis of leadership, because there's a lot of things that are renewable resources, such as leadership. No? So, how do, so I was really giving it a thought of, how do we tackle not one but many things? Is systems thinking, is you know, adaptation models, is geopolitics, is a lot of things that from the board to the management team, to the factories, to green blue workforce, the change is exponential. Yet, we continue on linear models. So in an ideal world, is first identify what do we need to unlearn and give, oops, sorry, and give the capacity you know, to, to give space first to, to then invest in what do we need to learn and relearn, because this is going to be ongoing. So I think the, the, the people that are eating the pie of this opportunity 
is, is, is out in the market and not necessarily universities, because companies are becoming universities. When you have to upskill your entire workforce, this is why we see that Google's now really the ones providing the education for the million jobs that are on cybersecurity in the US. Another one is when Walmart announces last year that they're going, they're, they no longer need uh, corporate degrees sorry, college degrees for their corporate roles. Boom, why? Because they're obviously over-investing internally in capabilities. So the market is self-regulating, meaning that those universities that are not on the vanguard of a solution-driven, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, I believe they will be behind. Nastasia, why don't you take a little bit of time to describe to us what Manasia does and how you fit into this sustainability journey in education? Well, to start with, I'd like uh, to say that Manasia, we explore the concept of cathedral thinking. We lay the foundation today so that we can see the result tomorrow, but we inspire all the people to follow our example. According to the World Economic Forum, 70% of employers cite sustainability skills gap and there is a loss of $8.8 .8 trillion per year. That's very expensive. So Monet's Association is trying uh, to create a change by mastering the art of small steps and joining the project of the Blue Schools of Sustainability, where we blend the experiential learning with academic subjects. And we think that it's the best uh, curriculum that could be imagined when the students uh, try real world applications and they understand the essence of sustainability. They need it to survive when they are just in the middle of the ocean. The Blue School of Sustainability, this is the project when uh, the students enter the floating classrooms and they learn the subjects like history, languages, science, and then they apply them in practice during their sail voyage during the trimester. For me, it's the perfect model which is also good for the employees and it has been tested since 2008 on a smaller scale and now we want to scale it up and increase our impact. Um, so, so Mariam, responding a little bit to what Viviana said about if universities fail to change how they think about what they're teaching, they will fall behind. What have you successfully seen universities be able to do in terms of changing how they work. You've talked about your ideal, but what's actually happening in most universities? Mm -hmm. So it, we are really at a turning point uh, on the higher education sector, uh, where indeed some universities are rethinking entirely their curriculum, which means also upskilling and reskilling our professors and entire teams. Uh, no matter what they do within the school, they need to think differently. So um, one, of, one example that we, uh, one, one initiative that we took at YESAG was to retrain to train on sustainability 100% of our staff, including professors, over seven and a half days. So really going deeper into, okay, what do we need to stop teaching? What do we need to start, think, to start teaching? And each department, whether it was the, yeah, the, the, the accounting department, the supply chain department, etc., actually wrote a roadmap of saying, okay, how do we take these new learnings into our courses, no matter what the course is? Uh, it re requires uh, really questioning everything that we've always done, uh, because most of our management disciplines were invented in a world that no longer exist. So that's, that's one example. And another example would be how we collaborate with companies um, successfully. And on this, we have some examples of, for instance, projects where we put actually 100% of our students in our flagship project go through this. We work with companies who come and share a real challenge on the environmental or social space that they're facing, something that's really that they're really trying to crack. And then students in small groups really consult across a whole semester for these companies. And this is where the real dialogues, authentic dialogues happen between students and companies. Uh, and it's a, a, often a, a, a wake up call or an eye opening moment for both companies and students. Students get to realize what's, what companies are uh, going through and why it's sometimes not so easy, why circular economy is actually more difficult than you thought, why moving from a product to a service is more difficult than you thought. Uh, but also companies get to understand how students uh, they, they want to have an impact, but they're also worried that they won't be given the space uh, within the company to actually uh, lead that transformation. Uh, so, so this is really the type of collaboration that, uh, that we see. May with. I add on that? Because I think that's a spot on. That's the present and the future. I think there's a role for everyone to play. I mean, we need academia as much as academia needs the real challenges that we're trying to address. Because a lot of the case studies, guess what? They're obsolete. 
because they were not really providing solutions. So we are in this together in where we, we have to find ways to learn as we go. And one of the things that I really like about yes, and I salute you for that, is that there's not many universities that have actually taken the humble approach of, hey, what do we need to first do internally? There was only one university in the world up until two years ago uh, that had as a mandate to upskill everyone in their, in their entire university. That was Barcelona. And it was a result after a strike of the students for one week. So that was very powerful. And I think it's now having its catalyzing effects because we're coming from private sector with all of these challenges, but we have students that are graduating without certain skills that we require. Two, if we are having universities talking about leadership, but not really leading the way on the system that is self-disrupting under it. But when we have universities collaborating with consultancies that have the capacity to reach, because the other thing is, and I don't mean to poke on McKinsey or whatever, but the, right, if we don't have a regenerative agricultural code that we could use, we have to figure it out. But it can't come from private sector regulated. More than ever, I would argue, we need academia and science to follow this. So I think it's, it's opening the door to a new level of collaboration. That's how CDOTS was born, right? Out of the need of all of these dots that we need to connect from academia, from a place-based economy, because the action is not gonna happen here or in the slides. It's gonna be in the local communities, addressing and bringing to life all of these targets that companies have. But in order to get there, we need a different approach where I believe universities are absolutely critical. So let me ask you a question then, because I think there's this challenge. You've talked about bringing kind of old and new together. We've spent a lot of time talking about retrofitting over the course of the day. How do you bring new mindsets into old established businesses? How do you make sure that the management of companies, the people who are making a lot of the decisions, are able to effectively use the skills of new employee or new employees who are entering the company who have gone through this sort of training. How do you fill that gap? Does that mean you need to create programs as well for your management to be upskilled? Absolutely, because these exponential changes affecting everyone, from the board members, the CEO, the management team, the factories, and guess what? The people that are going to have to build the grid and all of the skills that we're going to need to realize the trillion dollars of investments. So the opportunity is actually hype with AI, because AI, you know, now we say, okay, we have these 10 roles and requirements, AI takes, let's say, 80%, fantastic. We have unleashed some capacity, then what comes next? Soft skills are critical. So in, in early education, so now is when I think the systems are going to merge, because you have students that are going directly to corporate without necessarily going to university. So the dynamics are changing very, very fast. And I think the companies that will see these as an opportunity to transform internally and externally their capabilities will thrive. Because it's not just about what do they need to learn about AI, geopolitics, sustainability, is the exponential implication of this is changing too fast. So I imagine the present and future is constant learning, unlearning, relearning, and figured out through partnerships how to learn on the go. Because we have to create new business cases that the students can study. Anastasia, what age of, of kind of students are you targeting in the programs that you're running? Well, those are the students from the underrated communities and those who normally don't have a chance as they think so. But then when they start to, to learn on board of the sailing vessels, they get new career opportunities, they get new mindset, they develop leadership skills, uh, um, they also develop critical thinking, adaptability, soft skills that are quite essential for the world of tomorrow. And I think that's a pity that there is so little attention paid to the education, as education is a core pillar of sustainability. And if we respond to sustainability education SDG, we will respond to all the SDGs. We have to put the youth on the right track and that's how we can make the change happen. So we help the students, we try to make our program as inclusive as possible, but unfortunately now as we don't have so many partnerships, we can only target the children and the teenagers from the UK and Europe, but certainly we want to scale up this initiative. Okay. Uh, I just have one question on that, which is, do these students often go on to do kind of sustainability roles or to, uh, to enter universities 
with a focus on sustainability or is it more about them changing their perspective on life? Yeah, for example, we were, uh, we were collaborating uh, with an association in the UK and there also was like an initiative to clear the beach. And there were some students, uh, some youngsters who joined us. They aged, were aged like 15, 17 years old. And they were talking about their life. They didn't know what to do. And uh, speaking from my own experience, I used to work as a teacher at university. And during COVID times, there were three attempts of suicide among my students because they were lost. And when we were at this uh, beach clear up, they said, well, maybe sustainability is the key. I can do something related to it. I want to help the planet. I want to save the environment. Okay, we have this program, so we can uh, invite you to join us if you want for a trimester. So that's how we create this team. Go ahead, um, Fabiana. I know we're in war times, um, and I'm going to say something like bluntly direct. I think the only weapon that I see myself capable of building is education, and it's the biggest one. Because to her point, it, this is a, an opportunity, this industrial revolution, all of this that is happening to actually democratize access of education. I think during COVID and digitization, we saw a lot of ways to access there in places and regions that before we couldn't reach. And I couldn't agree more. This is not only a sense of purpose and dignity, but there's nothing more important than equipping someone with the skills and now with 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 technology with internet i mean anyone virtually could are could access harbor open curriculums you can be in the middle of of africa in a very underserved population or in the us in oklahoma in a tribal nation right so the, the opportunity to democratize education is critical um, the risk that we have of not investing in human capital in education is a national security one I would argue that because if we don't have a workforce that is ready for what is coming, we're just simply not prepared. And I'm happy to give two numbers that I usually quote when trying to make this point. The STEM roles, science, technology, engineering, math. We have about 20 million people in the world with these capabilities and it took our education system about four decades for this. In order to decarbonize our, in, our, our economy, we're going to need at least 10 times that very soon, in less than a decade. So when we see the gap growing and growing, the, what we need to do is across all levels, at the university level, at the company level, early education level, and all of this must, must be coordinated in a solution driven. Because the, the workplace and the education space is changing. I'm, I'm quite fascinating to see new models in where the students are hands on, in high school, doing already things with community, and that's how they learn. So, Miriam, we haven't spoken at all about government. Mm. Um, we've taken a lot of responsibility from the, the education side, from the private sector side. What role does government have to play for this ecosystem to work? Yeah, and it, it, it touches upon the, the first point that you made also about meeting, meeting the company needs um, on, on sustainability skills and bringing in the government question as well. Um, I think our role within the education space is not just to meet company needs, is to meet a broader uh, social, societal, planetary need, uh, which also comes from, comes from government and comes from um, the world, which is quickly changing and we're going to, through complex times, troubled, troubled times, and we cannot simply, because it's changing too quickly, so the demands that we're getting from companies um, do not necessarily reflect the full systemic view, do not necessarily reflect questioning the status quo. We have very few companies that come to us and say, uh, your students need to learn about uh, degrowth because on a finite planet, uh, we cannot grow indefinitely. And yet, they need to under we need to at least put it on the table so that they understand our finite, finite planet. Um, and, and there's a range of topics like that that are not yet addressed to us by uh, by, by companies, but at a government level, and for us also because we conduct research, our professors conduct research, they can take a, a higher perspective, they can take a, a, a step back on geopolitics, on what's happening in the world today, how our world will evolve, that we have the, 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 the freedom and the capacity to teach uh, and to prepare our students for the world that is actually expecting them tomorrow, and not just uh, today's needs for very specific roles, but to take that higher perspective. And Viviana, how does that work funding wise? Because obviously we're talking about education. Um, when you think about how do you funnel enough money in to transform these systems? Do you, does that come through tuitions? 
Does it need to come through government funding? Does it have to come through corporate funding? Is there a new kind of model that will facilitate enough money to drive this change? All of the above. Right? It's no different to the rest of approaches that we're talking about, scope three or others, right? This is a, the gap is very big. We're gonna have to all, not over invest, simply invest. And we're asking about government. So let me answer the question with an example. So in the US in 2018, the government had the opportunity to invest in human capital, in people readiness, $2 trillion. Unfortunately, only 10%, if not less, went to that purpose. The rest went to other corporate buybacks and other things. So the US, I think, had a big opportunity there to prepare for the future workforce, which is what we're seeing now, you know, changing at scale, when other countries were already investing from a competitiveness perspective in what the future skills and jobs will be. So the government has a huge role to play in all of it, but of course, private sector will be the one regulating and pushing the envelope and forcing these transformations. So if you have a new government in the US that is actually opposed to over-investing in education, that is actually a very big risk. And it's, gonna have, and it's not gonna give the same incentives to private sector. So more than ever, we need leadership on this because without a human capital, readiness and that could be not just from capabilities the dignity and the social tipping points that we have around the world demand investments in education so i mean and, and and resources i mean it's i don't think it's a right pocket or left pocket question we, we could argue the same about technology or the trillion dollars that we need every year uh, to address decarbonization when we put that in context of what it is in our economy is less than one percent According to the UN, you know, we're going to need, let's say, nine to ten trillion dollars every year to address the sustainable development goals. In proportion, that is like one percent of our global GDP, and it will be 0, 0.000 for the total wealth estimated in the world. So it is about unlocking those opportunities. But I would, I would say that we have to do it by doing, by building, because when you ask. Uh, or the countries, the nations, what is needed to prepare the workforce, the first thing they say is skills and building capacity because what we have is not enough. So we need to build, build with them and with that public-private funding to accelerate. Anastasia, where do you get your funding? Well, normally we get our funding from private investors. So that, uh, that's uh, not uh, the aim for us as we want to increase our impact and certainly we want to have some more government support. And now we have moral support from the foundation Prince Albert II of Monaco. That's already a good step forward. And we also have some dis having some discussions with the government of Greece as they are interested in this project. But uh, we need to increase our impact as I have already said. So we need to get more funding and we have to build more partnerships with the enterprises and universities certainly. But there's a good news, there's money. Okay, so the European, they have, they're providing a lot of grants in the US US, thanks to the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, the stimulus that there has been for this has been tremendous. So that's a good thing. What, what they're asking is organizations to unlock those resources from the federal state down to the communities. So, you know, for those in, 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 uh, in North America, there's still money available, right, that the government is trying to provide. And, and where there isn't, there are enough players from private sector with an appetite and what they're looking for is bolder approaches because we don't have time for just a few, like we just have to go all steam. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to your point about creating those partnerships and going after those things together. And I think it's not about a resource thing. In Climate Week, it was not about the finance on this. It was who has the operational capacity to execute locally and connect all of those multi-partners yeah. to actually get it done. Right? And this is where I think universities will play a critical role because they're the perfect you know, middle ground to provide this. And on the regulation side, I mean, this morning we were talking about regulation. Certainly governments are getting sharper with mm -hmm. how they regulate the education, the higher education sector in terms of the competencies that we need to deliver across all fields of education. So that's mm -hmm. also uh, getting sharper on that. Uh, yes, and I think that the funding has to be stable and the government funding provides it for us. So we are quite dependent on the private sector. Well, no government is going to be stable for, for a while, so we yeah. can count on that. <laughs> uh, no. So a couple of questions from our audience here. First, 
what are the reflections of the academic paradox that research about climate crisis doesn't necessarily change behaviors? Is there a conflict of interest uh, in focusing education on sustainability and climate change if we don't, haven't seen examples of that change behaviors? Do you even agree with that question? I'm not sure I understand the question. Neither. Sorry, what is the question? It's just quite a tricky yeah. question. <laughs> I think, I think if, I, if I had to summarize the question, I think what's being asked is that existing research on climate change hasn't necessarily changed consumer behaviors and other stakeholder behaviors. So is it ironic to focus education around understanding sustainability if it doesn't prove to be effective? We need to go beyond just understanding uh, understanding climate change is really the, the first step, the first brick of the wall, but beyond just understanding, we need to, to, to teach about uh, the change theories, about how to drive change within a company. All of the levers that have been addressed today are highly relevant and they need to be the other bricks that you put on top of just understanding. And typically this is how our programs are designed, is that at the very start of the bachelor level, awareness about climate science uh, is shared. And once students understand the science, then you teach about life cycle assessment, you teach about carbon footprinting so that they can navigate these tools. And then you teach about how a, an entire business model can be transformed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just really the first break. So I think what you're saying is actually what you're teaching is not necessarily about climate change. It's about the entire ecosystem of the way the world works and how you build business that can function in a world that is innately affected by climate change. Is that an accurate summary? Yeah, I mean, we still teach it at the start and then we build upon that, like you said. Yeah. But I mean, with the second point, which is kind of a follow-up of this, right? It says, what do you think the best approach to educate generations that didn't have opportunity to learn about the importance of sustainability at an early stage? What if we ask the same question about AI, right? Because sustainability is like, oh, I'm behind and I'm gonna start from zero. I don't know anything about climate change, for example. We could say the same about AI, hmm, where do we start? So the interesting thing is that there's everything yet to be done. So it, it, it's actually exciting to say no matter which point do you start the education process, it's gonna be relatively new for all of us. Yeah. So that's exciting, right? Because there's a lot of people in board members or anything that are, too, that are worried to say, I don't know. That's okay, no one does. And to that second question, right. we really need to go beyond the usual suspects. And when we talk about the stewards of tomorrow, yes. we tend to think about 20-year-olds uh, that are really passionate about sustainability. And there's some of them, and they're great, they're great, they have great ideas, but we're setting them up for failure unless we also educate mm -hmm people that have been in businesses for 10, 20, 30 years that are in decision-making positions that are scared. And some of, the, some of them come to us and say, look, I, I feel like my job is changing. And there's a study recently that showed that 93% of professionals across all sectors uh, were saying that their job was being transformed by sustainability. And they, they feel misequipped to, to manage that. And uh, some of our most uh, successful and impactful programs are actually not with youngsters, they're actually with executives uh, that are retraining their entire workforce. And that's the same percentage? So 94% of companies in the world say they don't feel ready for, this, for the future skills. So that tells you everything, right? Because what leaders are saying, I'm overexposed, undereducated, to the level of unprecedented change and interdependencies between them. And we could see it on steroids during COVID, right? The interdependencies that we have. And I think there was a good aha moment for all of us too, in saying it's not just that I need to learn what my implications on people and assets are in this transition, is how do I need to connect with others so when we have big challenges to address, that being decarbonizing, addressing healthcare problems, Let's take the example of the hurricane in the US as we speak, or unprecedented things that we're gonna have to collaborate. We realized during COVID the fragility of our supply chains and collaborations, right? So when you have to coordinate all of those things at scale, and we don't have those natural locations for that, guess what? I'm gonna look at academia. And I have a small point to add just 
I've started my career during the COVID outbreak and uh, I used to be a teacher and I worked in computational linguistics. So in 2021, I made an expedition to Iceland with maybe sailing and I saw a melting glacier and that's how I changed my mind. So I entered the university once again, Green Management School in Paris, where there were like classmates 50 years old, 60 years old, and we were all transforming our minds. And that's how I am contributing to sustainability now. So it's never late to start. I was 26, but uh, around me there were people who were 50, 40 years old. Let me ask one more question before we end this conversation, which is, do you think that in addition to changing kind of management courses, um, creating sustainability courses, does every path people now take through university and education need to include sustainability elements. Even if you're studying history, you're studying maths, you're studying politics. Is this just now the root of reality for what business, uh, for what education looks like moving forward? And this is an exercise that we are going through at the moment because so we've set the target of saying 100% of our courses will integrate discipline related sustainability skills. And so we are and many of our professors teach uh, yeah, coding, history, uh, languages, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so we are in discussions with professors asking these very questions uh, as we speak. And uh, yes, I would say that at least every discipline, every course should ask itself, OK, what is my impact on the world around me? Uh, and how am I, in turn, uh, tr um, influenced or transformed? How is my discipline transformed by a changing world? Uh, so, yeah, I would say it's a, it's a core embedded topic uh, into every uh, discipline. And if we look at it from a national security perspective, so the number one threat is climate. Yet, only 50% of the countries in the world, according to UNESCO, have mandatory climate learning. So ch just by that statistic, we think, holy cow, no, of course we have to address and close that gap. And we're talking climate, right? We're not even talking about biodiversity or geopolitics or the many other things that we need to include in that equation of in this changing world, regardless of the, the job domain, uh, industry, we, we have to adapt. And especially in early education, when you have already a generation that is in a complex sandwich accelerated by COVID of, you know, a lot of uncertainty on how the education models were go are going to evolve. Uh, in, in this system revolution is where I'm excited, right? Because there's everything to be done. It almost feels like everything, like, like, the, like the metals. I use a lot of alchemy analogy. So if things are melting, then we can change them. That's the good thing, right? Otherwise, it's a bit scary what is out there. I'm a stubborn optimistic, but we have to see it that way because that's actually we could have a blank piece of paper when we sit down with academics and others and say, well, what needs to happen so we can get to X, Y, and Z? And I'm talking two years, three years, five years from now, not even going too far, because the decisions that we're taking now in terms of priorities, investments, they're all of them, they're for five to 10 years. What is gonna happen in the next year has been already allocated, money and investments wise, right? But and if we look the Kodak moment of universities with the attrition, with, you know, with, with, with everything, it's already a huge signal. Yeah. Well, the, our clock has run out, but thank you all so much. And now I'd like to invite Matthew back to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.